All right. Uh, welcome everybody to the uh, social emotional learning uh, professional development training. This is uh, and this is not just for teachers. This training, this social emotional learning, it's for um, you know a anybody that that's really interested in in the topic. And uh, you know, I want to start by saying that uh, you know I'm glad everybody's here trying to learn something. Uh, we're all one family, okay? Uh, we're, we're all teachers. We're all one family. So together we make a family of educators. Um, so I'm gonna go through this this training. Uh, I think it's it's I, I've, I'm not sure how many slides uh, uh but the, but it's a rather in-depth training. Um, the PowerPoint I'll make available and the information uh, the information icon or in the description as well. And uh, you know I'll have my contact information uh, uh, somewhere if, if if you know the your school district uh, wants a training or something like that. All right, so like I said, social and emotional learning um, has become very popular, and uh, you know I mean that in in, in a good way. Um, and I don't mean popular in, in, in terms of like, oh, it's around now and it's going to be gone as time goes on. Because, you know, 10 years ago when I started teaching, you never really heard of social emotional, social emotional learning. And uh, now it's, it's, it's around in the form of curriculum and a lot of teachers are aware of it and they're using the word social and emotional. And, uh, you know, I think that's all, that's all for the good thing. That's all for the positive. So uh, let's, let's get into it. Uh, first off, uh, this was a, a short overview video um, that I put together. We're not going to watch this here on social emotional learning that I, put, uh, that I put out there. This is just a quick two, three minute video, but this presentation is really going to get into detail. Okay, and uh, some of the images uh, from uh, this presentation are, are found in, in this video. And I'll have some other, other videos as well. I'll, I'll also provide a link to this video. Uh, if, if you want to watch it somewhere in the, the information icon as well. So that, that'll give you like an overview. And, um, you know, I also cover that here, right? So, so let's begin. All right, social-emotional learning is a process by which people manage their emotions in a social setting. And, you know, we, we all think about ourselves, and, and I, I, think, I think we all know what, what it means to, to be a little awkward in a social position. Um, but some... Some have a much greater difficulty in social settings, and so, and some, especially children, okay, have a really difficult problems managing their emotions. You know, emotions are responsible for student boredom, inappropriate behavior, and you know, learning is directly linked to emotions as well. And our research uh, uh, on education shows that. Um, so you know, as educators, as a teacher, you know, and, and if you're just focused on instruction. Um, you know, emotions are very important. You know, angry students aren't going to want to learn. Excited students, you know, are going to have a lot of energy. Uh, depressed students aren't going to want to learn anything in the classroom. So, you know, emotions have a great effect on education. So, um, uh, teachers can use uh, student emotions to garner interest and maintain engagement and get their students to behave, okay? You know, school consists of assessment, uh, direct practices, lesson integration. There's a lot that goes on with school, but it's all tied to emotions. So SEL principles should guide curriculum choices, classroom activities, academic resources, assessment management, novels to read, things like that. Or, you know, when choosing, you know, what type of curriculum and, you know, what type of activities and things like that, you know, keep in mind you know the emotions of your students okay keep in mind when you're creating social activities and grouping students together how is that going to affect you know how is that going to affect all these students you know specifically teachers can identify and design um, SEL assessments okay to gauge student emotions and um, I'll see if I can find one out there on the internet as well and, and link that here in uh, social emotional learning assessment so uh, teachers can utilize lessons and activities that help students develop their so-called emotional intelligence and um, I'm gonna grab a pen here okay cuz I'm gonna try to put together a video on that emotional intelligence I've been wanting to do a video on that for a while like a, a whiteboard animation just write that down intelligence so emotional intelligence is the capacity to handle interpersonal relationships okay um, all educators should should model positive practices and manage their emotions and behaviors. So, you know, that goes back to like classroom management, okay? You know, if you don't want your students cursing in the classroom, you shouldn't be cursing in the classroom, okay? First, model the proper behavior. That also goes with emotional intelligence. You know, you can't, as a teacher, you know, be out there reckless, angry all the time. Remember, you're going to set the tone. So, 
in class lessons, uh, and, and we're talking about right now, and I kind of skipped the, the top of it, incorporating social emotional learning into the classroom, right? So, so you you want to get lessons. I'm, talk, I'm talking about actual social emotional learning lessons um, that can teach students how to respond to their personal emotions and react to the emotions of others around them, which is actually very difficult, you know, because if somebody, and and you got to think about this in the classroom. How many times? As a teacher, you know, if when your classroom starts getting rowdy and out of control, you'll see that that that, that one good student that you would never expect to act up and, and act crazy, you know, sort of follow follow the, the the group mentality. Okay, remember, students react to the emotions of, of others, and you know, there's also the the, the other side, the, the flip side, where you know some students are, are can be very can be very threatening, especially at the high school level, and others around them. You can kind of see the fear in their face when when that that one student comes to the classroom and he's and him or her, you know, they're very aggressive. So, you know, that that's part of it. Uh, this is a great idea, too. I like uh, hang up uh, SEL posters, okay, social emotional learning posters in the classroom that encourage children to show empathy, uh, give respect, and form relationships. I also, um, I also think I have a, a link to social emotional learning posters as well that I got to put down here. Um, all right, so from a school wide perspective, a school should make social emotional learning part of their mission and vision. Okay, and like I said, ten years ago, this wouldn't be part of their mission. You know, I, I don't, I don't know if, if they would, you know, think about this. Um, but now they are. You know, now schools are. Policies should be put in place that take into account the social and emotional challenges that come with school life. Okay, and schools can form SEL committees. This, this is actually a, a very popular uh, um, as well. And whenever forming a committee, you want to have a, you want to have diverse personnel. Okay, and it, it could be, you know, uh, you know, whether it be gender, whether it be job, you know, jobs, you don't want to have all just teachers, you want to have teachers, you want to have administrators, you want to have counselors. Um, so you want a diverse committee. All students need to feel safe and supportive. And in and, and the majority of, of my, my videos and things, I always stress the importance that students have to feel safe in the classroom. And that, I always tie back to, to bullying and, and things. You always have to, you know, as a teacher, one of the most important things, to, you know, well, the most important thing, the first thing you should do is protect your students. But, you know, uh, bullying, uh, bullying is something you got to nip in the bud. You really want to take care of it fast, and um, you do this by creating an inclusive environment. Okay, and we're we're gonna get more into that later. So there are currently five SEL core competencies. Here it's at Cassell. And I hope I'm saying it right. Um, this is where I got the framework from. So, you know, they have the resources here. So, you know, the, the credit here, I, you know, when I go to my, you know, works cited page, um, Cassell gets all the credit. Um, and, you know, I drew from many different social emotional learning sites, but the, I'm talking about the five core competencies. So it's basically a framework of what should, what should be taught to students across multiple classroom settings. And here, um, here's an overview of that video that I did. I, so I made a video here. It's a little blurry. Um, and these are the five core competencies from self-awareness to self-management to relationship skills, decision making. And in the video, I, I kind of broadly go over these uh, competencies. But I'm going to get into a more detail in this training. Okay, because the, the video was just, this whole video is maybe about three or four minutes. So uh, let, let's jump in here with the first one. Okay, so self-awareness. So we said there's five. Um, the ability to identify your own emotions, thoughts, and values uh, while understanding how they influence behavior. And it's broken down into, I, I've chosen four for the video, but there's actually a, a more component. Uh, self, excuse me, self-efficacy, identifying emotion, being able to identify your emotions, uh, self-confidence, uh, accurate self-perception. So let's, let's get into a little more on self-awareness. And um, and so uh, the next slide here says uh, self awareness. All right, so this is uh, this is the competency we're, we're focusing on. So this is if students have a high degree of self awareness, okay, they should be able to, you know, do the following uh, the following things listed below. So, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, the first off, they should be able to identify their emotions, okay? Know when they're angry, know when they're upset, uh, you know, happy, sad. Uh, create clear goals and a purpose, right? So that makes sense for self-awareness as well. And, 
you know, I know this is for students, but you know, even us as uh, as as educators, you know, we you know we might want to think a, a, about our own lives, and and you know, we, are we able to identify our own emotions to create our own clear goals, and you know, and things like that. Um, utilizing a growth mindset, okay, growth mindset. Uh, uh, that's uh, uh, also a very popular topic in education. Um, I have a video to that. I'll link as well. Um, you know, be honest with themselves. That's one of the toughest things uh, for people in life, uh, to be honest with themselves. And it's probably what holds a lot of people back. Um, live life with confidence and, uh, you know, uh, identify personal abilities and skills. All right. So uh, self-awareness overall is the ability to identify your own emotions, your own thoughts, and your own values while understanding how they influence your own behavior. And it's really, the, I probably should underline the second half, it's really knowing how they influence your behavior. So through self-awareness, students will be able to understand other people and how other people perceive themselves. So throughout a child's lifetime, they're going to experience a wide variety of emotions, okay? And they're going to experience these emotions each day. Okay, the first thing you have to do is teach students to identify their own emotions. Students should know who they are, what they believe, understand their parameters. Okay, that that's that's sort of overarching uh, with emotions. So here's what's good about this uh, presentation. Throughout the presentation, I'm going to actually, you know, give you solid examples and and you know lessons and things like that you can use. So here are several strategies and activities to help students identify their emotions. One is emotion check sheet. Okay, you can have students just circle their emotion if they're angry or sad. You can teach the eight core emotions. Have lessons on emotional intelligence. Uh, have students <coughs> excuse me. Have students write in a diary journal. Okay, journaling I think is one of the 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 most therapeutic um one of the the most uh, therapeutic activities you can have students do. In the classroom, and, and there's just wonderful research on uh, uh, having students write in their diary and journaling, and, and you really get to find out a lot about students and who they are and how they look at you, okay? Because in their journals, they're really writing to you, okay? And you know, with what's going on, with, where so many students are isolated nowadays and things like that, and I think a lot of uh, you know, with this whole pandemic, a lot of students are hurting. Um, you know. Using a using a, having them write a diary journal, um, you know, maybe they'll open up and and you know, I hate to say it, but you know, during this time, you know, children are unprotected, um, because when they go to schools, you know, that's that's when you're you're able to identify any type of like physical abuse and things like that. So you know, these these diary these diary journals are really important. All right, so um, these are the ten basic emotions. Um, and then you can have eight core emotions, so so it's really not that important. Uh, different people have, have done research on, on different emotions, so don't focus too much, but but this is like a broad one here. So happiness, sadness, anger, anticipation, fear, loneliness, jealousy, disgust, surprise, and trust. And, you know, I always think about when you go to the doctor, and, you know, when I go to the doctor and, and uh, when I went to the emergency room, they gave me a sheet of, like, uh, uh, you know, faces. They go, what are you on a scale of 1 to 10? And you know the one is is like you're you're okay you're, you're still smiling and ten is like excruciating pain, and I always say you know when I'm there if I'm trying to get a nice uh, you know I, I forgot what it was, I think it was a, st a gastroenteritis with a stomach virus you know I was dying for like some sort of pain medication I'm like ten 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 you know, um so the smiley face thing for the younger kids is really good in helping them identify their emotions just like doctors use. Uh, all right, again, with self-awareness, right? So having self-awareness requires having an accurate self-perception of oneself. Um, and I'm going to get into this a little more. Um, students must be able to accurately describe their motivations, their life goals, their life uh, life beliefs, and what major personality traits they possess. All right, just the same students should be able to accurately describe their strengths and weaknesses. That's important because, you know, some students, and as a, as a basketball coach, uh, you know, I'll have some players that, that think they're the greatest players in the world and think they're going in the NBA and stuff like that. And, you know, that's an that's not an accurate self-perception. Um, and, you know, it's often the, the players that are the most terrible that, that in their mind, you know, think they're the best. And, you know, I think back to uh, that show with Simon Cowell. Um, what the hell's the name of it? Singer Star? No. Oh, American Idol. You know, there will always be a group of... Uh, you know, singers that would come out there and, and then, 
you know, they'll come out and they'll think they're the best and, and they'll sing and they're terrible. You know, it'll, it, it'll sound like strangling a cat or something like that. And, you know, the other two judges, the nice judges, wouldn't want to say anything. And then Simon Cowell would have to come out. But, you know, he would obviously, you know, you don't want to do it his way. He'd kind of make fun of the people. But, but you know, those individuals that come out and sing and think they're stars, they don't have an accurate self-perception. Okay. Having a positive self-perception goes hand-in-hand hand with high self-esteem. Right, both are necessary to build resilience. Okay. Um, you know, you want all... Uh, all students have, have positive qualities. Okay. And they should see themselves in a positive way by focusing on their positive traits. There's going to be times in a student's life where they get rejected and feel dejected. But a positive self-perception will motivate them to push forward. And this pushing forward theme is part of the growth mindset. Yeah, here we go. So one way to help students push and continue ahead in life is to use the growth mindset. Um, students believe that their most basic abilities can be developed. That's what a growth mindset is, that you could develop skills and abilities and talents through hard work. Okay, And this attitude, this uh, growth mindset, uh, nurtures a love for learning and a resilience. Keyword resilience. Um, all right, so the following video. So I made a video on growth mindset about three years ago or something like this. Uh, this is here. I'll also link it as well. Let me I'm, let me skip this. Okay, so self awareness. We're, can, we're still on the, the first competency. Self confidence is essential to anybody's success. Um, you know, confidence is you know conf, conf, confidence is what brings courage. I think, and you know, great teachers know the importance of developing self confidence in their students. You know, teachers make it a mission to. A mission in their classroom to build their students' confidence whenever the chance present. And students will always remember you if you put them down or if you crush them. And, you know, like I go back to the NBA player. You know, I'm not there to crush the NBA kid, the, the, to, to crush the player that thinks, that thinks he's going to the NBA. Um, but what you would want to do and what I would do, I would just explain to them how hard it is to get into the NBA. You know, where it's like a... It's like hitting the lottery or something like that. And, and, you know, hitting the lottery is like getting struck by lightning, let's say, 25 times. And, you know, you don't want to crush them. You want to build their confidence. But like I said, you also want them to have an accurate self, self-awareness. So here's a list, list of some confidence-building activities and exercises for students. Daily positive affirmations. Gratitude journals. All right. Again, this is confidence-building. So they can be thankful for everything they have. Positive sentence completion worksheets. Increasing of smiling. Uh, body language stances, practice strong handshake, handshakes. Maybe not now during the pandemic, but that was a good one. Okay. Self-efficacy. From a social standpoint is an individual's ability to initiate and engage in social settings. And that's not easy to do uh, for, a, for a lot of people. Now, in the context of SEL, students who, ha who exhibit positive self-efficacy believe that they can handle social situations, emotional setbacks, and life's pitfalls with strength and resilience. Okay? And resilience keeps coming up. That's a theme here. So, according to psychologist um, uh, Bandura, there are four different ways to develop self-efficacy. So, first is mastery experience. The experience that a person gains when they take on new challenges and come out successful on those challenges, okay? So this relates to academics too. So teachers must create goals and assignments where the tasks are challenging yet, ac yet achievable. So many times I see the word challenging yet achievable. Those are the appropriate goals. And you got it. You how do you do this? Differentiated instruction, okay? According to, oh yeah, so the next one, uh, vicarious experiences, okay? Another way to develop self-efficacy is by observing other individuals successfully complete a task and feeling that you achieved it through those people. So by being teachers can be a positive role model, okay? Because mastery experience is, is, is not easy for most students to achieve. And it's not just academics. It's in, it's in all life's tasks. Social persuasion. Our students receive encouragement and positive feedback while they uh, take on difficult tasks. And they can be emotional and social tasks. Teachers can use verbal persuasion to convince a student that they can complete a difficult problem. Talk these students through it, okay? Build up their confidence. Tell your students that one day they will grow up and be successful. And emotional and psychological states of well-being, the physical and emotional stability of a student um, that can 
influence how they approach a complex problem. Meaning, as a teacher, you know, help your students get the emotional and physical support through related services such as therapy. Okay, remember, it's physiological states of well-being and emotional. You know, incorporate anxiety reduction into your lessons. So, let me go back to the four, right? So, just to, to give an overview of this. So, how do you develop self-efficacy? Master experiences. You take on new challenges. That's probably the best way. You do it yourself. Um, vicarious experiences. You know, positive role models. Feeling like you achieved it through them. Being with them. Social persuasion. You get a encouragement and feedback. You get them to, to start doing things and succeeding. Or And, and you know, emotional and psychological states of well-being. You know, these children have to, you know, they have to be well um, emotionally and physically. All right, so some ideas and activities to help identify values, okay? Students should be able to identify values that are important to them, okay? I don't have it here. I used to have a, I had like a value poster I did, I don't know, let's say seven years ago when, when I was in a, one of my education classes and uh, it was like I was doing my teacher philosophy or something and I have to say what values are important to me, and I still remember them. It's it's not here. Where like one of them was like courage, uh, 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 honesty was was uh, important to me. Courage, honesty, and I think duty too. Oh no, loyalty. I always think loyalty is very important. So those are like the three that I remember. I think there was six. All right. So we did self awareness. Let's go to self man uh, self management. Okay. So again, we said you got to manage your emotions. You got to manage yourself. And here are some some examples we're going to get to goal setting. Um, set your own goals, organized, uh, stay organized, self-discipline, and stress management, right? So this is the second competency, self-management. So students with a high degree of self-management will be able to react properly in bad situations, engage in uh, stress management techniques, show up on time, be organized, locate materials, stay true to their convictions, take the initiative when required, you know, manage their, manage a variety of emotions, so uh, self-management can be defined as the ability to manage your own emotions, thoughts, stresses, and impulses, right? So educators must help students overcome these obstacles. And that's what this little thing right here is, to have to help them overcome obstacles. Oh, I love this quote here. All right, from J.C. Penny quote. Okay, give me a stock clerk with a goal, and I'll give you a man who will make history. Give me a man without a goal, and I'll give you a stock clerk. A stock clerk. And that goes back to, to right here where we said, um, you know, uh, goal setting. So I love that quote. So teachers are able to foster uh, self-management in students by asking them to create their own life goal goals. Setting goals not only gives a purpose to someone, but also lights the fire of motivation. So when a student sets a goal, they're essentially holding themselves accountable for that goal. That's why goals are so powerful. On the first day of school, many teachers, and I do this too, Always do it. I ask students to create a list of goals for the up for this upcoming year. And it doesn't have to just be about my classroom. It doesn't have to just be about bio class or math class. So here are some uh, goal setting lessons and activities for the classroom. And I've used some of these here. Um, students create their own bucket list. Um, fill out a, a goal ladder worksheet. That's the one I've used. Um, oh, where do I want to be in 10 years? That's a great essay. You know, evaluate yesterday. Mind map of life goals is really good. They can draw out. I've I've recently done that um, on my map of life goals, and uh, believe me, it's nowhere near what I want to get done. But at least I'm chasing something. Uh, stress management. All right, so stress management is part of self management. It's something that is often perceived as being an only an adult problem. So we think of stress management management as an adult problem, but it's a it's a, it's a it's a child problem as well. You know, Dr. Phil always talks about how powerful stress is. He's like, stress is very, very powerful. And, you know, sickness, mental health, it's all linked to stress. Uh, children have stress just as adults, and they're probably less prepared than adults to deal with stress. You know, schools have a responsibility to educate students on how to handle their stress. Teachers may incorporate stress management techniques, okay, all right, now we're talking about journaling, which I mentioned earlier. And, you know, I'm big on journaling. Uh, comes up and continues to come up. I wrote that here because it has a variety of benefits. 
Student journaling is a form of therapy where students get to express their emotions. So if you're a teacher encouraging students to journal, do not make it mandatory that they share. Yeah, yeah. If, if they're journaling, don't make them have to share. You can read it and you can even have them journal themselves you know, and, and say, you know what, I won't read it if, if it's really bad. But it's going to help them out. Okay, um, some teachers practice classroom mindfulness and meditation. Earlier I wrote down that I wanted to do a video on emotional intelligence. I also want to research this a little bit too. My classroom mindfulness. I'm going to write this down. That's another one. That's a very good topic. i gotta, I got to get on this one here. And uh, meditation. So students are requested to quietly sit down and clear their minds. Next, students are asked to focus on positive thought of experience. Positive thoughts. And there are many variations of classroom mindfulness. Um, another classroom activity to manage stress is to engage in focused breathing techniques. I always think of my Uncle Rocco who used to... He used to smoke so many you know, so many camels he would smoke and everything. And then he would say, oh, you know, it's right that he smokes camels because he does this focused breathing. And this was before it was like a thing. And he would just breathe in fresh air all the time. And he would say he would say it would make his lungs better. And um, he really believed in it. And then he would make me do it once in a while. He would just take a deep breath, hold it in, and, and let it out. Um, breathe in through your nose, allow your chest to fill it with as much air as possible, hold that air for two seconds, and then slowly exhale. Repeat the process. It will pay off. All right, so other ways uh, to practice stress management include, um, you know, allow time for art. Art is very therapeutic. Aromatherapy. You know, um, whenever I go in, in Julie's office, um, she works in special services. She has those, I don't know what it is. It's like it's... Let's off a smell. It's some sort of aromatherapy thing. I just when I go in there, I just feel positive. Um, something you might want to do with your classroom. I know another teacher, um, a great English teacher, Kaz, uh, Miss Keynes does the. She does, always practices yoga. That really helps out too. The kids love it. Classroom walks. I'm thinking of of, of our history teacher. She takes them for walks. All these things, you know, work out. They all help. Uh, you know, manage stress, going for walks, aromatherapy, yoga. You got to fight stress. So here's a different stress management tips for life. And again, this isn't just for the students, you know, us as educators. So how do we manage stress? So let's assert our feelings and opinions, okay? And I don't mean that by being nasty, um, you know, and, and just shoving your opinions and your feelings down, down somebody else. But you don't want to be, you don't want to let, you know, get bulldozed, you know, by other people. Um... Get needed rest and sleep. Okay, that's so important for stress. Um, you know, if you're up, if you're up, you know, 20 hours a day, of course, of course, you're going to be a little stressed out. Stay positive and difficult. Avoid alcohol and drugs. Eat healthy meals. Nurture friendships and relationships. It's important to have have a, a best friend, a good friend, and you could always tell a good friend because they're happy. They're happy for you when you've done something good. And you can tell a fake friend because when you're doing good with your life, they're not happy. And exercise regularly, which I haven't been doing. Okay, another key component, ability to stay organized. Okay, in your day-to-day -day and long-term tasks. Organizational skills set students up for success. Well-organized students are less likely to become overwhelmed. Okay, and have that stress. Procrastination leads to stress, big time. Uh, give me one second here. Take a short break for some coffee. <sighs> okay. Uh, staying organized le will lead to an overall better academic experience for both the student and the teacher. Organized individuals are more productive and better able to communicate with others. And staying organized will create more time, free time. So teachers can help their students become more organized in the following ways. Checking for organization of notebooks. Have students title and date all assignments. These are great tips. Uh, prepare students for long-term projects. Organizational checklists. And require students to make weekly to-do lists. All right. The third competency, social awareness. Okay, And it's broken down to, to three components here. But there's more we'll go into. Respect, empathy for others, and appreciating diversity. Okay, so let's get a little bit into social awareness here. So students with a high degree of social awareness will be able to do the following. 
Find positives in all people. Okay. Recognize social demands. Give thanks and gratitude. Identify situations of injustice. Just because you know an injustice doesn't happen to you doesn't mean it's not happening to somebody else. A lot of students have trouble understanding that. Accept everyone for who they are. Understand what influences behavior and take into account the perspectives of others, not just your own self. Okay? Remember it's social awareness. Okay? Be aware of, of how others in the group feel. Okay. So again, it's the ability to understand social norms and take perspectives and empathize specifically with others from diverse backgrounds. You know, and as a teacher, you know, think about how how many students today lack respect, okay? Re I don't, I don't know how it was, you know, 100 to 50 years ago, you know, 70 years ago if if students were more disrespectful or less disrespectful, but I could say now that uh they're also disrespectful. One second. My daughter's here. Thank you very much. Okay. So, um, think about how appreciative you are of those students that do show respect on a daily res basis, right? I can think of, of a handful of students that are very respectful right now just off the top of my head. And I am very appreciative because, y you know, it goes a long way. And respect is a key component of social awareness. Um, sorry, I went back one. Okay. So let students know if they respect someone, then they'll treat them that, then they'll always treat that person well. So, you know, if, if a student or a player of mine is treating me terribly, I'll be like, no, you're not showing respect for me. Okay. If you were, and, and teachers, this goes for you too. You know, whether it be your school administrator or your co-teacher, you know, if you respect that person, treat them well. The golden rule of respect is to treat others the same way you wish to be treated. Okay. Those who give respect, get respect, okay? I remember that from a Sopranos episode. Tony Soprano said that to uh, little Christopher Moltisanti, who was complaining about, I don't get respect. You know, he, he's Tony Soprano's uh, little nephew, and, you know, he's at the bottom rung of, of the, the mafia, and he's complaining he don't get respect, and, you know, Tony, the boss, is saying, you don't give anybody respect. That's why you don't get respect, okay? Teach students that. Not to use the mafia as a reference, you know, I'm sure... Okay, uh, create a culture of respect and teach students to respect others through the following strategies. Culture of respect. Have students give sincere compliments. Okay, anybody can tell a fake compliment. And I used to work with this woman, and Mr. Mansfield would, would, would bring this up too. Because he, he had great one-liners, Mr. Mansfield. He would call her the, the, the queen of the backhanded compliments. When she would give me a compliment, but mean it in a negative way. So, like, if I had my students doing a project, she would, she would be like, Oh, Mr. Arella, this is turning into an arts and crafts room. Lovely. But, like, it wasn't a sincere compliment. And she would constantly, you know, would do something like that. And, and uh, you know, we don't want our students to be like that. Okay? A social awareness. She should have social awareness as well, that woman. And now I'm not going to mention her name. All right, so uh, list uh, list people, you know, list of people students respect. That's something you can do. Have students write down people that they respect so, so that they can understand, you know, and they can look at those people and realize, you know, how they treat them. Write an autobiography, you know, tell students, write an, auto write an autobiography of someone you respect. Celebrate individual gifts and talents, you know, um, activities to improve communication, okay? Um, all these um, help create a culture of respect and helps teach students to respect others. Okay, so these are just some strategies. So, uh, socially aware individuals have empathy. That's the ability to understand and share feelings for others. Students that exhibit empathy are able to appropriately respond in different situations, if you have empathy. Teachers may incorporate the following activities to help nurture empathy in their students. Active listening exercises, uh, guess the emotion picture sheets. That goes back to the doctor, you know. Um, predict emotions from a list of situations, role-playing activity. All right, so diversity in the classroom. Um, diversity in a classroom setting can be thought of as an understanding that each individual brings their own strengths, experiences, genuine ideas, and friendships to the classroom. That's what diversity in the classroom means. Okay, you got to understand that everybody has something positive to bring to the table, regardless of, of race, culture, gender, uh, ethnicity, uh, sexuality, anything. From a global perspective, 
You want your students to appreciate diversity present in schools. Identify lessons and activities such as culture studies that can introduce diversity. Okay. Commit to incorporating a multicultural curriculum. I've got a full presentation, this type of presentation, a multicultural curriculum, which is getting big, um, and that'll be out. If it's not, that that'll be out soon. Okay, so this is an overview of multicultural uh, education, and uh, you know, basically, it talks about the prejudice reduction. You can, you could kind of see it a little bit here. Knowledge design, equity pedagogy. A bunch of stuff, but I'm not. I'm not gonna play. It's a what is it, a five minute video. Let me let me get this off. There you go. All right. Next up, relationship skills. Um, and I was not very good at uh, relationship skills. You know, uh, with my wife. Uh, you know, I had to. I mean, there's still problems. So you know, these these are the corner works. These are the cornerstones here. Uh, and I've, I'm just looking at communication is key. Communication is key. So we'll get to that. Um, so you got communication, teamwork, and that's important, shared responsibilities, uh, relationship building, how do you build those relationships? So students with a high degree of relationship skills will be able to do what? Um, create strong relationships, uh, effectively communicate, stand up for people's rights, uh, showing leadership ability, resolving conflict, uh, resolving conflict. Relationship skills are defined as the ability to establish and maintain healthy relationships with diverse individuals and groups. Relationships are vital to a person's social, emotional, and overall well-being. Uh, there's a multitude of data that suggests forming positive and meaningful relationships actually contributes to a long and healthy life. People with good relationship skills are also good at working in teams. Teamwork can be developed in the classroom throughout group work and cooperative learning. Students have to use soft skills when working with peers. And when I first started teaching in Newark, um, one of the big things they focused on there was soft skills for their students. Um, you know, being able to, 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 to work as a team and get along, you know, for the students there. And I remember one teacher saying, oh, it's a waste of time. But I don't, I don't think it's a waste of time at all. It's so important in life. Okay. You know, you can have, you know, I think, I think a good example is to show the Big Bang Theory with the guy Sheldon who, you know, is the smartest guy in the room, but, but really can't take care of himself, and he doesn't have any soft skills, and, and it, you know, it hurts him, and it's not just in his life, but, like, he's always getting in trouble with his boss and things like that, and I, I, you know, he's, like, not getting promoted and stuff, and he doesn't have soft skills. Um, this is an over, uh, this is a short video I did on cooperative learning. Um, it talks about strategies and stuff like that. We'll skip this, too. I'm gonna skip all these videos here. So, uh, teachers may incorporate the following activities for students to function on a team. So, here are some, some soft, here if you want to help build soft skills with your students, here are some activities. Uh, team Jeopardy, uh, Sing Along, Scavenger Hunt, Build a Tower, Minefield, Traffic Light Game, all fun. I remember the Traffic Light Game as a kid and Jeopardy. Uh, positive relationships that last through the years uh, exist when people are able to communicate, okay? As a teacher, you've got to be a good, communi a good communicator, and, and those that aren't a, a good communicator struggle, unfortunately, because there's a lot of very, I've seen a lot of very, very smart um, individuals get into the teaching field, and they failed because they weren't able to communicate, um, and, you know, and we, we got we to gotta help our students be effective communicators, okay? Little things, okay? Don't speak too fast. I'm doing that now. Um, I probably shouldn't speak too fast, but, you know, it's, it's a lot here. And, you know, I don't want this thing to be two hours, so I'm, I'm rushing it. Avoid using too much slang. Enunciate your words. Uh, you know, it's important, for, it's important for teachers to spot communication difficulties. Um, you got to communicate with the speech teachers and things like that. Or, you know, send out a referral to the CST, the INRS committee. Now, being able to effectively communicate requires the following fundamentals, according to Stanfield, uh, 2017. Um, Turn-taking, introspection, uh, conversational skills, the ability to pause, respectful vocabulary, and more. Much of the communication that students experience today is through electronic communication. Communication and leadership are key components of schools that utilize a 21st century life skills framework, okay, which is similar to Cassell. Okay, this is the video for life skills framework. 
I'm gonna. I want. I. I don't want this to play. Um, this does a good job too um, of preparing students, and this kind of goes. This kind of goes along with social, social emotional learning. Um, the main website you want to get to here is uh, P21 actually. Okay, they provide this framework just like Cassell provides uh, the framework I'm using now. Sorry, let me pause. Let me pause that. There you go. All right, there are a number of different communication activities and games that teachers can use with their classroom. Uh, the first one is telephone. Oh man, I've I've seen that go horribly wrong. And uh, but it's a fun game for the younger kids. I I remember a. I, I believe it was a social worker was doing this when I was teaching in in Newark, with like a group of tenth graders. So, you know, you know where their mind is. At the, you know, they're they're older. They're te they're teenagers. So one's going back and forth, and it started with, I, I think it started with like, you know, uh, the the social worker says something in one person's ear, and they say it to the next student, the next student, and then at the end, the last student has to say what it is to to demonstrate. How people change and 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 and, and, and you know, and it, it, it never stays the same, and people elaborate, and uh, you know, towards the very end, it, it ended with something very, uh, very explicit, <laughs> very, uh, very nasty about the social about the social worker, and the kid didn't want to say. It. He's like, I don't want to say it, and she's like, just say it. He's like, no. She's like, just say it, and he blurted it out, and uh, I just remember that. Anyway, all right. Positive relationships are built on trust. Positive are built on trust. Um, I was talking about uh, loyalty. Uh, that's not in here, but I, that's very important. Um, it's always important to remember that building relationships take time. Okay, that's the problem with these with, with these kids that make these new friends and they go, "Oh my, that's my BFF. That's my best friend." It's like, no, you just met this person. You know, my best friends. Like I'm thinking about like like my best friends right now, and I'm gonna name them like uh, Leo and Pablo and and you know Nelson and and you know all of them, and and I've known them since I was you know grade school, and we've remained friends and we've built that relationship. It takes time, you know. I'm in 30 plus years with these guys. No, not 30 plus years. No, not, not that long. 20 years. 20 years. So, uh, great teachers form positive relationships with their students, and they teach students how to form positive relationships with others. Um, for example, uh, that means not being a fair weather friend. You got to stay by the f good friends, uh, uh, stick around for the good times and the bad times. You know, many special needs children have more trouble than most in forming friendships. All children today need assistance in communication and development of personal relationships. Relationships. And relationship skills, you know, require practice, just like anything else in life. So you got to teach your children, you know, teach your students to build, you know, meaningful relationships by introducing them to the following techniques, right? Uh, appreciate uh, by teaching them to appreciate other people and their differences. Appreciate the differences. Uh, schedule time for relationship building. Avoid gossip. Be a good listener, and address uh, relationship needs. All right, the last one here: decision making. Uh, when I think of decision making, I think of my brother. He makes horrible decisions. Horrible decisions. Not to point him out here. Not that I'm any better than, than him. But, uh, you know, he he does everything right. And then at the, at the last minute, he always makes a, the, like the wrong decision. And he'll be the first to tell you. So I'm not knocking him. I'm not putting him down because I love him. All right. So students with a high degree of decision making, uh, decision making will be able to have an open mind analyze information and make the right judgments, you know, find solutions to social problems and complex problems, reflect on their own role in a community, and know the importance of critical thinking. Bye-bye. Uh, Decision-making is the ability to make constructive choices about personal behavior and social interactions. Decision-making is an important leadership skill, and it's necessary for any workplace environment. The first part of decision-making is self-reflection. Students must understand their own personal situation before, before making any important life decisions. So uh, self-reflection is a type of mediation or a thought process on your own actions and your own motivations, right? Think about where you are in life. What changes can you make in your life? You know, what changes can students make in their life? So here are some reflection activities. 
and teachers can try with their students. And listen, as a teacher, it's very it's very important that, that you reflect on your own practice. Um, some of these activities include reflection blog, uh, building a scrapbook, reflection on essay writing, case studies, in-class discussions. Okay, a decision making uh, requires a person to be able to analyze the situation. Students must recognize the importance of critical thinking. They should make use of all available data and evaluate the effectiveness of that data, of that information. Okay, uh, problem solving is the next component of decision making, right? So problem solving is the actual process of finding solutions to complex problems. Educating students how to solve problems is something that teachers should be doing in the classroom, okay? I'm going to make a video on this as well here, you know, teaching problem solving skills. Um, the following videos are supplementary. Um, these are two other videos I put together here. One on, you know, teaching problem solving and one on critical thinking in the classroom. Both, I think, are, uh, you know, both I would recommend to, to, to teachers looking to, you know, help students in, in these areas. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to get both of these going. Okay. So, responsible people make responsible decisions, okay? Um, you know, we must guide our students to be responsible members of society. That's something else to remember as teachers, you know, we're uh, collectively, right? I always say we're, we're a family of educators, and everybody here is a family, right? We're all, we're, we're all in this together here, but, you know, collectively, we're raising society. You know what I mean? We're, we're teaching the, 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 you, the future, Okay, so, you know, we have a responsibility. So whatever decisions our students make, we want them to take accountability for them and ultimately evaluate, and I underlined evaluate here, whether those decisions were right or wrong. Okay, um, this is the end of the, okay, this is the end of it here. Um, th this was a product, uh, 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 the PowerPoint. Um, thank you for sticking around. I know it was a long one. I appreciate it. Uh, I think I just said, you know, we're all in a family. We're in this together. We're a family. I'll get some links out there to some resources. Um, join me for the next one here. All right, I'm going to try to keep this going here. And um, it's all professional development stuff here. All right. So, you know, whoever's sticking around for this, you know, power to you because, you know, you're becoming a, you're becoming a, a better, te you're becoming a good teacher. My daughter just handed me some, some quarters. Thank you. All right, guys. I will. I will. Let me get out of this. I will see you at the next one. Thank you.